Hey everybody, could you all stand and turn your Bibles if you have them into Psalm 23. And I really like if we read this together because it's so fun to read together. We're going to do our third message on Psalm 23, the third and final, uh, at least for this small short series. And uh, beginning in verse 1, I bet you know it by heart, this is not a funeral, uh, but we're, we're, it's the opposite of a funeral. But um, you ready? One, two, three. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My cup, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Heavenly Father, we pray that you bless our time in the Word together. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. It's good to see you all today. Uh, amazing. I could really tell when Jean when, when there was no piano, and then all of a sudden I heard piano. Because Pastor John sp uh, plays piano also. You see him in Baltimore playing sometimes. I said, hey, you should go up there and play. And, he's, and Raymond was here too. And, uh, and he says, no, I didn't come here to play piano. <laughs> so, and then all of a sudden I heard you play, and I was very blessed. Thank you very much for being up there. And uh, uh, Ryan on the drums, and Justin on the guitar. It was awesome. And uh, praise the Lord, we are, we are following mercy today. And I was just going to say, I want you all to stand again. And this is part of our, our message today. All stand. All right. And I want you to switch seats with the person next to you. But that might be tough for Justin and, uh, and you guys. Like, don't split up couples, anybody. Don't split up in a couple. Switch seats with the person next to you. They're good. Okay. All right. Everybody doing that? All right. All right. Now you can sit down. If you were obedient, you can sit down. If you weren't obedient, you have to stand for the whole message. And it'll be long. It'll be very long. So... Psalm 23 has been a blessing for sure. And, uh, you know, because, and I'll just review it real quick. We did one message strictly on verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. That was, I think, three weeks ago. Then two weeks ago we spoke on verse 2 through verse 5. And, um, and I was very blessed by those messages. Very blessed to see how much David, the king, really relied on God more than anything, right? Because we, people have this thought, and I did too. I said, well, we are New Testament believers, so we believe in grace, and we believe in mercy. But those Old Testament people, they were just following the law. It was all about the law. How many people have thought that before? Come on, don't be afraid. Raise your hand, right? We all thought it was the law. But David was different. David really saw uh, what was going on with God. He saw that that grace and mercy were above the law. So what can we say about mercy? Pastor John, I mean, we did not coordinate uh, this. You would think that we did, but we did not coordinate. But I'm speaking on mercy today. And what can we say about mercy? <clears throat> justice, as he spoke about, what is justice? It's getting what you deserve, right? Justice is getting what you deserve, right? And grace is another thing. Grace is often confused. But grace is getting what we don't deserve, right? Grace is getting what we don't deserve. And so, and then what is mercy? Mercy is very interesting. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. Okay? So justice is getting what we deserve. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. And mercy is not getting what we do deserve, which is awesome, right? I did get, he talked about getting pulled over by a, by a um, police for speeding, right? Well, when I got Emma's car, there was her first car, it was a stick shift. And it was a Saab. It was a Saab 9000 era. Very fast car. It's like 235 horsepower. And I, I figured, you know, for the first couple of weeks, I'm going to drive it, right? I'm going to drive that car around. It was, it was kind of old. It was a 96. But I was getting inspected. And I was zooming. And honestly, I didn't realize it. But I was going fast. I think I was going 75 miles an hour down 695 up there in Essex. And it was a 55 mile speed limit. 
And I got kind of pulled over. And the guy came up to me, and I'm like, I'm guilty. You know, I'm guilty. I was totally guilty. And he came back and said, Mr. Shibley, I'm not going to give you a ticket today. And, I, and that was mercy right there. That was mercy. Because I didn't get what I deserved. But you know what, it, what would have been grace? If he had pulled out a hundred dollar bill and handed it to me. Now that would have been grace. <laughs> that would be getting what I don't deserve right there. And so, um, but a good way to describe mercy is in this story right here. It's, by, it's from R.C. Sproul, who is a radio guy and a, and a teacher. <clears throat> On his first day of teaching class, <clears throat> excuse me, his students of, I'm sorry, his, let me start over. I'm like Justin right now. On his first day of teaching his class of 250 college freshmen, R.C. Sproul carefully explained the assignment of three term papers due on the last day of September, last day of October, and the last day of November. Sproul clearly stated that there would be no except extensions, except for medical reasons. At the end of September, some 225 students dutifully turned in their papers, while 25 remorseful students asked uh, and quaked in fear. We're so sorry, they said. We didn't make the proper adjustments from, the high, from high school to college, but we promise to do better the next time. He bowed to their pleas for mercy, and he gave them an extension, but warned them not to be late next month. The end of October rolled around. Oh, oh wow. Yes. Mercy right there. <laughs> All right, fine. fine. <laughs> All right, you guys see, I was, that was a test, by the way. That was a new pass. Um, thank you very much, Michelle. <clears throat> While 25, uh, while 25 remorseful students quaked in fear, we're so sorry, they said. We didn't make the proper adjustments from high school to college, but we promised to do better next time. He bowed to their pleas for mercy and gave them an extension, but warned them not to be late next month. And the end of October rolled around, and about 200 students turned in their papers, while 50 students showed up empty-handed. <gasps> Have you ever been there? <clears throat> oh, please, they begged. It was homecoming weekend, and we ran out of time. So Sproul relented once more, but warned them, this is it. No more excuses next time. You will get an F. The end of November came, and only 100 students turned in their papers. The rest told Sproul, we'll get it to you soon. Sorry, Sproul replied. It's too late now. You get an F. The students howled in protest. That's not fair. Okay, Sproul replied. You want justice? Here's, here's what's just. Here's what's just. You'll get an F for all three papers that were late. That was the rule, right? The students quickly taken, I'm sorry. The students had taken my mercy for granted, Sproul later reflected. They assumed it when justice suddenly fell. They were unprepared for it. It came as a shock, and they were outraged. It's true, isn't it? Justice is hard. Justice is hard. It's justice is hard, um, and that's why we run from justice. Oftentimes, we run from justice, and it's and as Pastor John was saying, mercy is kind of hard to figure out. We actually understand justice better sometimes than we understand mercy. We want mercy. And we want grace, right? We all want grace. Oh, give me grace. But we understand justice better sometimes. Um, that's why they talk about the scales of justice, right? That's why there's all kinds of things that happen when people talk about justice and different things like that. But here what we see, oh, what we saw, was uh, we saw in uh, Psalm uh, 23 and verse 6, it says, Surely goodness and mercy shall fall. Follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And that's why, if you were to title today's message, it would be following mercy, following me. Following mercy, following me. Because mercy is such an interesting subject. It's such a true subject for us as Christians. It's like amazing, really, when you think about it. Because there is nothing that we deserve. 
There is nothing that we deserve in that sense, but we're conditioned to think that we do deserve things because of justice. Because justice is the way that we think. Justice is the way that everybody thinks. Well, if you do this, you get this. If you do that, you get that. That's how the world works, we think. And we all assume that when we go to heaven, God is going to be there, maybe, if we get to heaven or outside of the gates of heaven or whatever, whatever you want to say. God's going to be there with a set of scales, right? Going to be like the, uh, the, you know, not the kind of scale in your bathroom, but the other kind of scales, the scales of justice, right? The scales of justice. And we're going to all think, well, if I did enough good works, I mean, maybe we think this, maybe we don't. If I do enough good works in my life, then they will outweigh the bad works. And God is going to put the good works on the one side and the bad works on the other side. And that's, what's, that's how it's going to go, right? That's how it's going to go. And we're all going to be either with God or without, not with God for the rest of eternity, right? Because he's going to weigh what we did and to see if we, uh, you know, if we balanced out correctly. Um, in Luke chapter 8, though, it talks about something completely different. And I think this is very, very interesting for us today. Luke chapter 8, Jesus is speaking. He's speaking a parable about a Pharisee. Now, what is a Pharisee? Everybody know? A Pharisee is one of these guys, he knows the law in, in Israel, right? He knows the law back and forth, upside down, right side up, left, right, whatever you want to call it. This guy knows the law. He knows it by heart. He's got it written on his forehead. He's got it memorized. He's got everything. He's, he's sweating the law, this guy, all the time. And so Jesus begins to speak to a crowd uh, here in uh, Luke chapter 18. In verse 9, he says, Also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. I really like that. We skip right over that. Jesus is speaking to a crowd of people that felt that they were righteous. They felt that they were better than other people. They despised other people because they looked at their condition and they compared the other person to themselves. And they said, I'm a whole lot better than them, right? I'm a whole lot better than them. Man, I'm better than those people. It's crazy. Well, so Jesus speaks to them. He says, two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee. And, and the other a tax collector. Now a Pharisee, you got you to gotta see the picture here. A Pharisee is a very upright individual. Kind of like me. Very nice. You know, like I'm wearing a tie. I'm wearing jeans today. It's kind of funny. When I got out of, it was this weird thing when I got out of the hospital. I told my wife, I said, I want to go to church. And you all know me. I wear jeans, a jacket, and a shirt, no tie, right? That's how I do it. It's how I mean, It's kind of like my habit lately. But then when I got out of, out of the hospital, I wanted to dress up in a suit. I don't know why. Something was wrong with my brain, right? I wanted to dress up in a suit. And I wanted to go to church in a suit. And I, that's why I've been. But now I've, I've, like, I've slacked a little bit. Now I'm down to jeans. I still got the tie, though. I still got the tie. But anyway, so you got the upright Pharisee, right? Yeah. They're very upright. Everybody sees them as upright. These are the guys. Do you want to be good? You want to be like a Pharisee. You want to be one of those really good Jewish people that obeys the law, does their prayers, fast twice a week. You've heard it all, right? Well, this guy's going to tell it all right here. He says this. He says two men went up to pray. One a, one a Pharisee. Oh, and the other was a tax collector or a Republican. No, I'm sorry. A Republican. That was a bad political joke. Don't say that. If you're a Republican, I don't mean anything against you. If you're a Democrat, I don't mean anything against you. Or if you're an Italian. No politics. No politics. Don't ever talk about politics. We're in charge, Pastor Jeff. Okay. But I just heard that joke like 30 years ago, Republican, so I thought, well. Okay, what is a Republican? A publican is a tax collector. Actually, it says tax collector, didn't it? I'm such a King James guy that it just sticks in my head. The publican was a tax collector. They are the opposite of a Pharisee. The absolute opposite. The Pharisee. <coughs> The tax collector, he's sneaking home because he's stealing from his neighbors. He's collecting money for the Romans, right? He's collecting taxes for the Romans. These are despised people. These are people that live on the other side of the railroad tracks. These are the people that steal. These are the people that do all kinds of 
evil things with all the money that they got, but they're not very good. So Jesus here <clears throat> is talking about two wildly different people. The Pharisee and the tax collector. The bad guy and the good guy. And so what happens? The Pharisee, but they both went to the temple. That's the key. They both had an obligation. They both were Jews. They both felt an obligation of some sort. But the Pharisee stood and then he prayed thus with himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other, <laughs> like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I mean, talk about bold, right? Even this guy. All right? I'm not like him. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off, he would not as much as raise his eyes to heaven. Okay? So totally different. This one guy is like a peacock. He's like, yes, Lord, I'm so good. I'm one of your cherished few. I might as well be gilded in gold. I might as well just be, you know, you just should just take me to heaven right now because I'm so perfect. I do everything you say. I mean, when I get to heaven and, I, and the, the scales, you know, my good works go on that scale, boom, it's going to go up like that. And the other thing's going to fly off the handle. There's going to be nothing on there. The bad is gone. It's all good. It's all good. But the tax collector, on the other hand, he was very guilty. He was like, he couldn't even lift up his eyes because he felt so bad about the things that he had done. And look what he said. You all know the story. You probably read it behind me anyway. But anyway, and now where am I? I'm in verse 18. Here we go. Yeah. Oh, here's the third. Much as raised his eyes to heaven. I can't read. I'm going to turn around. Much as raised his eyes to heaven. Uh, but he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me. A sinner. Wow. What a difference between these two guys, right? God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And you know, people could look at that and just say, yeah, right. Okay, sure. Well, prove it. Give us something. Show us something. Show us some good work. Show us something that you could do. But Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And so mercy followed this man. Mercy came to, the, to this man's life. God, be merciful to me. I'm not counting on my goodness because I've got nothing to show you. I've got nothing to show you how good I am because I'm not good. I'm bad. I'm not good. I'm not bad. I'm, I'm just, I, I mean, I'm bad. I did bad things. I did all kinds of things that are bad, but I'm going right now to beg you for your mercy. And I really like that because when we have this idea of having scales in heaven, of having these scales of, of justice, right? And then, oh man, I'm so good. God's going to be happy with me. We're going to put all that good stuff on that one side. And then other people think, oh man, I'm so bad. God's not going to be happy with me. And they think all the bad stuff is going to go down. And you know, it's going to determine their fate. But that's not how God works. That's not how God works. Yet we are in our lives. And I do the same thing, but in our lives. It's not that we're not supposed to do good works. It's not that we're supposed to be bad. It's just that our salvation is not based on those things. It is based on mercy. It's based on God doing something for us. Grace that we don't deserve. And us not getting a punishment that we do deserve. It's amazing. It's amazing to say we, you know, we dwell in the house of the Lord forever because of mercy. We dwell in the house of the Lord forever because God has given us. God has given us something so great. I love the verse in... John 3, uh, 16, of course, but John 3, 17 as well, you know? John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. But look, verse 17 says, um, oh, what does verse 17 say? Uh, here we go. Um, 
For God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world. Isn't that interesting? Not to condemn the world. He didn't come here to condemn the world. But we think maybe he did. Or we think that that's what the Bible is all about. Or we think that's what religion is all about. And some religion is all about that. But that's not what the Bible is all about. The Bible is about salvation. The Bible is about the Father, the, the Lord, or, or Paul saying um, in 2 Corinthians 1, 3, that he is the Father of all mercies. Isn't that great? He's the Father of all mercies. Um, Psalm 89, verse 1 Says, he says this, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. He wants to sing about them all the time. The Bible says that mercy and truth met in Psalm 85. Mercy and truth met. It's not that mercy doesn't agree with truth. Mercy does agree with truth. That's why Jesus came. Jesus came so that we could um, receive the mercy of God. So that God could open up these things. For us, and I, I think it's amazing. It's amazing that God does things not according to our sin, but He does it according to His mercy, which is awesome. It's awesome, and that's why we go to Him. That's why we cling to Him. That's why we love Him. We love people that are merciful, don't we? Don't we love people that are merciful? Yeah. And we can't stand people that hold us to every little thing, right? I mean, John, Pastor John is right. You know, right? Do it right, do it right, do it right. Oh, there's a speck of grass, there's a speck of grass. Wait, wait, you didn't cut the lawn perfectly, you went off a little bit that way. And you hate it when someone follows behind you all the time, telling you all the things that you did wrong. What did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? Don't let your relationship be like that, by the way. What did I do wrong? 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 You don't want, you don't want the law following you. You don't want obligation following you. But what you do want to follow you is mercy. Right? You want mercy. We follow mercy because mercy follows us all the days of our life forever and ever and ever. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'm not going to get kicked out of the house of the Lord because I did something wrong. But man, let us treat each other with mercy. Amen? Let us love our wives with mercy. Let us not pick out every little thing. I remember today I was pulling up to that, you know, that stop sign, that light. On Connecticut Avenue, you take a left into Adams. Oh, yeah. And you know, I love this about my wife. She stops at yellow lights. Does your wife stop at yellow lights? Yes. Does your husband stop at yellow lights? Uh, it's very dangerous to stop at yellow lights. It's <laughs> my attitude, right? Don't do that. Keep going. Oh, honey, come on, go. It's yellow. It's yellow. <laughs> it's yellow. It's yellow. There's no cars. It's yellow. Oh, man. Man, I am so unmerciful sometimes. Unmerciful. Or is she unmerciful? I'm not sure which it is. Maybe she stopped at the yellow on purpose. No. I mean, well, she did, but I'm just saying that's how we are. That's how petty we are sometimes, right? We make a fuss about something so small, and we don't give mercy when those things happen. Um, but mercy is amazing. Mercy pursues you all the time. And we don't maybe recognize it all the time, but mercy pursues you all the days of our life. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever all the days of my life. I think it's amazing. I think it's amazing. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. But goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. I just think it's amazing. It's amazing to know how God loves us. It's amazing to know that the Bible says in James chapter 2 and verse 3 that mercy rejoices over judgment. Isn't that good? Mercy is happy. Mercy rejoices over judgment. Oh man, it's amazing. I want to read you something and then we'll close. This is from a song. And the song is called Oh Beautiful, uh, I think it's Oh Beautiful Scandalous Night. And it goes like this. Go up I'm sorry, go on up to the mountain of mercy, to the crimson perpetual tide. Kneel down on the shore, be thirsty no more, go under and be purified. Follow Christ to the holy mountains, sinners sorry and wrecked by the fall. Cleanse your heart and your soul in the fountain that flows for you and me, I'm sorry, for you and for me and for all. 
at the wonderful, tragic, mysterious tree of the cross. On that beautiful, scandalous night, you and me were atoned by his blood and forever washed white on that beautiful, scandalous night. And that's really amazing, isn't it? I mean, the mercy that we received at the cross, the forgiveness that Jeff, Pastor John spoke about at the cross, how important is it for us also to extend that forgiveness in the smallest way? Sometimes we think, you know, we, 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 we get picky, and we get petty, and we get funny like that. You know, we get funny like that. It's not like a big thing, but then we get picky at little things. But in those little things that can cause big problems in our life. And when we extend mercy to each other, when we extend mercy and we, we let things slide, it's actually much better, you know, to let little things like not stopping at a red light, or I'm sorry, at a yellow light, uh, slide. You know, when we let those slide and close our mouth, and I'm as guilty as the next person, but I, I recognize, you know, my mercilessness at times. And yet, he is the God of all mercy, the Father of all mercies. And we are blessed and we're so happy because of the mercy that we received at the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. When we were able to accept his righteousness in place of our wickedness, which is amazing when you think about it. And you think about those scales of justice that we expect to see. That big scale, they need justice, right? Withholding the scales, it's not even there. God doesn't think that way. God doesn't work that way at all. Salvation is through Christ and Christ alone. Salvation is through believing what Jesus did on the cross, that he died for us, that he shed his blood for us, and he offers us a gift of eternal life. It's amazing. And then he offers to change us and to make us more like him. That's mercy, Pastor Ron. That's mercy, right? That is mercy. And let's, let's read what he says. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell, not temporarily, but in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. So we become part of this house. We become workers in this house. We, we love this house. Because this is where the Lord is. Amen? Right. This is where the church is His house. Right. And the body of Christ overall is His house. And we dwell in that house forever. All the days of our life, we dwell in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercy today. We thank you for your loving kindness. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you are merciful. We thank you that you grant us favor. We thank you also that you grant us pity sometimes but that you are good. You are always good. So Lord, we pray, Lord, if there's anybody here that's never received Christ as their Savior, that they've never believed about this mercy, about this salvation that you have given for them, that you have died on the cross for them. If you'd like to believe in Jesus Christ and you never have as your personal Lord and Savior, just say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and live. I accept you as my Savior. <coughs> say that prayer. He knows what you mean when you say that. We ask the Lord God now to bless the rest of our day. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's bring the band up here for a final song.